Okay, everyone, hello, and welcome to uh, DAC 1319, your first lecture from uh, Chapter 1 and Loosening the Grip. Uh, there uh, is another discussion that will be featured on here from your first reading assignment in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous and some videos posted as well. So uh, we might as well get started and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you and I have a uh, PowerPoint presentation. We'll talk about the material that was covered in uh, Loosening the Grip. Uh, yeah, might as well go over the slideshow from the beginning, huh? And this is, uh, like I said, DAC 1319, Substance Related and Addictive Disorders. And your textbook for this course is uh, Loosening the Grip, one of them. This is a very good book, has tons of information about... Uh, uh, the, about substance use disorders, alcohol disorders in particular. It's a book about alcohol. So let's jump right in. Uh, a whole book on alcoholism. Yep, alcohol, ethyl alcohol, ethanol, E-T-O-H, uh, arose by any other name, as Shakespeare says, smells just as sweet. Uh, and there are bunches of alcohol out there. Alcohol occurs all over the place in nature. And uh, alcohol is produced by a process called fermentation that we're going to talk about here in a little bit. But uh, anything that will rot produces alcohol. It's produced by all kinds of plants, and vegetation, and uh, 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 fruit, and, uh, and even uh, animals, um, you know, uh, uh, roadkill. You can get roadkill alcohol, though I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, it's one of the oldest drugs known to man. Uh, and uh, human beings discovered this, I'm sure, way back in the day when they went into the back of the cave and there was some uh, fruit that had gone bad in the bowl and they ate it anyway and drank the juice and then suddenly felt pretty good about things. Uh, Alcohol is also used uh, in this country not just as a beverage, but it's also used uh, ritually and convivially. It, it's a beverage that we drink kind of like coffee uh, when we're not thirsty, really. Uh, and it's used ritually if you take communion at church or you toast the bride at a wedding or uh, uh, something along those lines. It's used convivially if you go to a barbecue and have a few drinks, uh, you know, have a few beers, go to a, a ball game and have a few beers, go to uh, uh, go out on Friday night and have a couple of drinks while you're out with your friends, that kind of thing. That's convivial use. Uh, it's got some other uses too, and we'll talk about that as well as we get a little further in. Uh, Beer, wine, mead, etc. Uh, these are uh, the starting points for uh, for ethyl alcohol, and these are beverages that are produced through fermentation. And fermentation produces natural alcohol. How alcohol is viewed in society depends on um, you know who you are, where you live, uh, what, what your society teaches you about those. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, people believe that uh, alcohol is a gift from the gods to gladden the hearts of men. Uh, and in some religions it is. Other religions expressly forbid it. Uh, and most every culture on earth has experience with alcohol and with other drugs for that matter too and how they decide to respond uh, to, to that reality is kind of uh, uh, based on their history with it, what their religious beliefs are, what their social beliefs are, what society teaches them about the, uh, the context of uh, uh, using certain drugs. If you look right here, uh, uh, from uh, right to left up here, that's Nombrid, or St. Bridget of Ireland, 
who's the patron saint of brewers. That's the little statue up here in the in the corner. Uh, and uh, she's a good Catholic girl. Uh, uh, and she actually got to be a saint for a lot of other reasons besides brewing, but uh, she is the patron saint of brewers. Uh, to her right, this old guy over here, Ajir, is um, the uh, Norse god of the sea. He's also uh, the god of mead and of drinking, and he is his mead that they uh, consume a lot of when they get to Valhalla. Um, over here to the right is Dionysius. He's the Greek god uh, of wine. Uh, and in the Roman uh, pantheon in, uh, uh, on Mount Olympus, he's known as Bacchus. Um, and uh, he had his own religion, uh, grew up around him, a cult of Bacchus. Um, and down here is Haythorth. Uh, and she is uh, uh, the Egyptian goddess of beauty, seduction, uh, wine, intoxication, and believe it or not, cosmetics. I thought it was pretty cool that the Egyptians have a goddess of cosmetics, but that's her. Uh, down here at the bottom is a artist's rendition of what he thinks a Roman bacchanalia. Uh, must have been like, and, and, and Bacchan uh, the Bacchanal occurred in the springtime. Uh, it was a fertility ritual, but oh, Hathorth was also the goddess of fertility, uh, and fertility was big with ancient cultures, uh, where, uh, uh, but uh, the Bacchanal uh, occurred in the springtime, and people got really drunk and got really naked and did a lot of fornicating, and it was all about uh, renewal and rejuvenation and birth and that kind of cool stuff. Uh, and so here's an artist rendition of Bacchus at his Bacchanalia uh, uh, with some loaded lady who's topless in there apparently inventing the cotton-eyed joke. That's pretty cool, huh? But anyway, fermentation is how uh, alcohol uh, comes into the world. It's the action of yeast on sugar in the presence of water by which alcohol is produced. And alcohol is a byproduct of the fermentation process uh, or, or is an output of the fermentation process. Probably be a better way of thinking, of thinking about it. Uh, and the highest alcohol content of fermented uh, beverage, uh, of a fermented beverage is about 14%. And this is because uh, Yeast is, uh, yeasts are organisms, they're little microscopic organisms, and when you put them in the present, uh, in, uh, on sugar in the presence of water, they eat the sugar, and uh, their waste product is ethanol, is ethyl alcohol. Uh, or it could be, depending on what else they're eating, it could be methanol or butanol or isopropanol or whatever. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, as they uh, eat the sugar, they uh, eliminate alcohol. And that's why the highest content of fermented beverage is around 14%, is because yeast organisms have to abide by the same laws of nature the rest of us do. And that particular law of nature is that an organism cannot survive in its own waste. So when the uh, their environment reaches around 14% ethyl alcohol as a toxic environment for them, and the yeast bugs die off, and they don't produce anymore because of that. Well, if that's true, what's up with Mad Dog 2020 over here? That red grape wine, it's uh, a fermented beverage. How did it get to be 20%? <coughs> well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, is reinforced with distilled alcohol. Distilled like distilled water, uh, distilled like gasoline is distilled in a refinery, is refined down through stages until it becomes something else. Distillation is a process of transformation. Cajun Cooking 101. First you make a roux, right? 
Well, it's sort of the same with distillation. It's that first you make a mash, and a mash is a fermented solution. So if I were going to make some moonshine, uh, some of uh, Granny's corn squeezings, like from the Beverly Hillbillies, or Granny's rheumatism med, depends on uh, who you're talking to, uh, I'd start with corn, and I'd put it in a, uh, a, a tub, I'd let it ferment, and turn into alcohol. And the, and I could drink it that way. I could you know I could take the corn and it'd still taste a little bit like corn, uh, t t and the yeast would probably make it take a little bit like taste a little bit like bread too, like homemade beer. Uh, but uh, anyway, I make the mash. This is the still from the swamp, uh, from the TV show Mash, and it's medical beakers and. Uh, uh, surgical tubing and things like that. Uh, MASH is Mobile Army Surgical Hospital uh, and uh, a very famous TV show from the 70s, a very popular one rather. And Trapper John and Hawkeye Pierce uh, made uh, uh, homebrew, made uh, uh, white lightning in their tent, the swamp. Thus it was the swamp still. And uh, what happens is they take their mash, which goes in here, and it, the mash starts uh, the process. It is fermented alcohol. You start a fire under it. You see there's a tube that comes out the top, and these tubes roll around. They go through some stages here, but they come out on the other end. These are martini glasses, and they'll get a, uh, make, them by the, make it by the glass full. What you do when you distill alcohol, uh, whether crudely like this or uh, you know more in a more sophisticated manner, is you vaporize the alcohol. I can't remember the name of the TV show. I think it's called Moonshiners. It's a reality TV show that was on some. I don't even remember what network it was on uh, for a while, and. Um, but they had stills, and if you if you watch that, they would build fire under this barrel, and the barrel would have the mash in it. The steam rises off of that solution, and it went up into a, 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 col a collection dish, a, a cone that directed the the steam up through the to the top where there was a ventilation hole in there, and the steam would go out the ventilation hole. And uh, as it did, it entered into a coil, and that coil could be copper tubing or it could be uh, surgical tubing like uh, they have here with mash, or it could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, stainless steel or whatever, glass. Uh, but the point is that the tubing collected the condensed gas, and what that gas is really is ether, because ether is alcohol with the with the water removed from it. This is Stuffy Snuffy Smith, by the way, uh, Billy DeBeck's uh, famous uh, uh, Ozark Mountain hillbilly uh, moonshiner. He uh, debuted in 1919, the same year that the. Uh, uh, 18th Amendment was passed in the United States, bringing about prohibition. Uh, and uh, Snuffy's always having to get away from the revenuers and from Sheriff Tate here, uh, who's after him all the time. Although uh, Tate, <laughs> more often than not, uh, uh, partakes of Snuffy's product. You can see the jugs there with the tube dripping into them. In any case, to make a long story short, uh, when you put the fire to the mash, alcohol uh, uh, basically has a lower bo uh, has a lower boiling pot point than water does. So the first steam that comes up off of that solution is alcohol vapor or ether, and it's vis visible. You can see it. It goes up into the tube as a gas. It condenses up there and re. Uh, forms as a liquid and drips out the other end as grain-neutral spirits. Uh, and grain-neutral spirits is almost a pure form of alcohol. 
and it's grain neutral because when it comes out on the other end, you can't tell what it was made from. In the mash, you can tell if that's made from corn, potatoes, tomatoes, watermelon, raisins, you know, whatever you made it from, it'll still have that taste. But on the other end, grain neutral spirits, it really won't. It'll come out as a clear, relatively odorless and somewhat tasteless liquid. It's, you know, it doesn't have much of a taste to it, but it does have a, a, a big sensation to it because it's an irritant and it burns and does all kinds of cool things when you when you drink it. You probably had a shot at one time or another, so you know what I'm talking about. And that's grain neutral spirits, and that's how you distill alcohol. Now, uh, when we, uh, when, when uh, uh, the Europeans came to the New World, the Indians who lived here, they weren't, you know, uh, uh, innocent of intoxicants. They were making their own stuff, but they didn't have distillation technologies. Distillation technologies came over uh, from Europe, and, uh, and that was a gift that the European settlers brought to the New World. A uh, gift indeed. How do you know uh, when you're getting good grade whiskey? Well, I'm glad you asked that too. Uh, once upon a time, uh, in order to uh, determine whether whiskey was high quality enough that, so that you weren't getting ripped off, uh, the British came up with a test. They would take the product, the whiskey that was manufactured for you, and uh, pour it over gunpowder laid out on a table and then they'd stick a match to it. If the whiskey's strong enough, the alcohol's gonna ignite, and when the alcohol ignites, it's gonna ignite, ignite the gunpowder, and then you have poof, uh, and uh, uh, there, there you have it. And that's proof that the alcohol is strong enough because it's strong enough to catch fire and light the uh, gunpowder. If it's too weak, the gunpowder will be wet, it won't light the alcohol will not be strong enough to catch fire. It won't light either, so it's not a proof. In the modern era, proof is twice the percentage of alcohol in a solution. So if you see something that's 90 proof, uh, see if a solution is 45% uh, in the whiskey, then it's 90 proof. And conversely, if you want to work that backwards, Percentage is half the proof. So if you see 180 proof, it's 90% alcohol, right? There's no such thing really as 100% alcohol outside of laboratory conditions because once alcohol is exposed to air, it sucks water from the air and begins to, uh, and begins to dilute itself. Uh, so when you're manufacturing uh, alcohol, uh, the purer the alcohol, the better off you are. Uh, all alcohols, for instance, will give you a hangover, but if you have uh, alcohol that's not, uh, uh, that they don't do the controls to get a purer alcohol on the other end, and that, that grain neutral spirits, it could have something called congeners in it. And congeners uh, is a term uh, that, um, uh, and, and, I, and I forgot to put a slide in for you for congeners, but it's in the book. Uh, uh, congeners are uh, other alcohols and oils that are contained in a distilled, um, uh, distilled product. And th some of them are pretty toxic, but they're there in trace amounts. But they may have a little to do with the severity of the hangover that you feel. And so you have these alcohol products, and there are a lot of them to choose from, right? And they're really sophisticated uh, things. Jack Daniels and, and George Dickens, uh, Tennessee, sipping whiskey and Four Roses and, uh, you know, Wild Irish Rose and uh, Seagram Seven and uh, uh, Crown Royal and all of these good drinks. Uh, but they're not really put together. Uh, uh, they're not really that different. They're not really put together that differently. Uh, and I can hear you saying, okay, Bushart, for instance. Uh, well, for instance, you make grain-neutral spirits, 
and it comes out from a distillation process, and it's an alcohol that, as far as you can tell, is not related to, it doesn't matter if you make it with barley or hops or corn or potatoes or whatever, because it comes out grain-neutral spirits. It's ethyl alcohol, and it's high-grade ethyl alcohol. If you want to turn that high-grade ethyl alcohol into Jack Daniels, you get a big wooden keg, right? And you mix this ethyl alcohol with water till it's the uh, proof that you want. Then you pour it in the keg. Uh, but before you pour it in the keg, you take a rosebud, which is a big uh, heating head that throws out a, a big um, uh, flame. Uh, and you put the rosebud in there and you set the inside of the barrel on fire. Let it burn a bit. Uh, then you pour it in... <coughs> your uh, uh, alcohol and water solution uh, and you put the top on it and let it set for around seven years like that chick from the 70s show, you know, of the commercial. And um, when you come back seven years or so later and you open that keg, you have a certain proof of liquid and you've determined that by the mixture, the, the water and the alcohol that you put together till you got the proof that you want. Uh, but now it's not colorless or odorless anymore. In fact, it has a color, and it's a, and it's a dark brown-looking uh, drink, and it's got a smell, and the smell is a little medicine-y because of the alcohol uh, and a little woody because of the wood that has been soaking in for the better part of a decade. Uh, it also has a taste to it, and now the taste is a bit of a charcoal taste. And why wouldn't it be? It's been sitting in a burnt barrel for, for seven years, and it takes on the flavor of the wood. Uh, and that's how you make Jack Daniels. Uh, if you want, if, you, if Jack Daniels, if you take the whiskey out of there and it's very dark, and you want to make it lighter, uh, you can doctor this any way you want to. You can make blended whiskey by taking white liquor, grain-neutral spirits, and mixing it with dark liquor, the Jack Daniels, until it's blended uh, and uh, blended to the taste that you want. You can add water back to it. You can put other flavorings in it. And that's how you make uh, uh, whiskey. Uh, that's how you make vodka. That's how you make gin. That's how you make all of this stuff. And um, the uh, active ingredient, the agent that we spend our money for, is the drug, the central nervous system depressant alcohol uh, that's contained in there. Uh, vodka is an interesting drug because it's the easiest one to make. It's the easiest thing to make out of the, the whole bunch. Uh, vodka is Russian for water. Uh, wishka or the, well, how we get our whiskey is the Irish word for water. Uh, so they had some pretty good ideas for, for what was in this. Uh, if you want to make vodka, and traditional vodka, by the way, is made out of cabbages, although in America we consider it has to be made from potatoes if you want to get really good vodka. And I think in Russia they use a lot of potatoes, although that's a new world plant. It's not something, you know, uh, potatoes came from Mexico. Kind of makes you wonder why they call it an Irish potato, huh? But anyway, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, you make uh, you uh, make your mash, you distill it, and it doesn't look smell or taste like a potato on the other end of it. Uh, you got grain neutral spirits. How do you make vodka out of it? You add water till you get the proof you want. Put a cork in it and sell it to somebody. Uh, that's how you make uh, vodka. If you want cherry vodka, put some cherry flavoring in it. You want some orange vodka, put some orange flavoring in it. You know, uh, you want it a strong vodka, put less water. Want a weaker vodka, put more water. That's how you make it. If you want to get gin out of that, take that vodka you just made and pour it through a gin head uh, and put juniper berries in it. It'll come out smelling a little bit like a pine product, like a cleaning product, pine o pine. It'll have a bit of a, uh, it'll have a bit of a, 
uh, evergreen flavor to it because you put juniper berries into the gin head and then you filter uh, the alcohol product through the gin head and it comes out tasting like the, the uh, whatever you loaded the gin head would. Uh, you could load it with used sweat socks. I don't think you'd like the product, but it come out tasting a bit like a sweat sock. Uh, if you wanted um, uh, slow gin, uh, put some wild plums in the gin head. Filter your vodka through the uh, wild plums. It'll come out on the other end tasting like slow. Thus, you have slow gin. By the way, that's S-L-O-E, slow, wild plum, not S-L-O-W, slow, like sneaks up on you and gets you later kind of stuff. I, I don't. It's one of those alcohol myths that are out there. Uh, slow refers to the flavor of the plum, not to the effect of the, of the uh, drug. You're welcome. Uh, and you can make it all kinds of different ways. Uh, uh, Mexican tequila, real tequila, good tequila. It's tequila con gusano, uh, and it's got a worm in the bottom uh, from, that lives in the cactus plant that the tequila is made from. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, people uh, sometimes uh, d have, have philosophical discussions about whether or not to eat the worm when you get to the bottom of the bottle. Trust me, when you get to the bottle of, bottom of the bottle, the worm is not an issue. So why drink anyway? Why do people do this? You know, alcohol is an irritant. It's a toxin. The one thing that all alcohols have in common is that they're poisonous. Uh, ethyl alcohol is less poisonous than the other, uh, other types of alcohols that are available to us, so we can drink more of it without dying. Uh, but when you're staggering around and losing coordination and can't speak and are falling down and losing consciousness and all of this kind of good stuff, those are symptomologies of having been poisoned. Toxic means poisonous. The word toxic means poisonous. Toxic is the root of intoxication. What do you think they're describing when they say you are intoxicated? Uh, you're de describing a, a, a situation where a person is exhibiting symptomologies of having been poisoned. Some of them are mild. Some of them are uh, not so mild. Some of them can be fatal. You can overdose and die from this drink. Uh, so why do we do it? Well, there's good, good, good reasons advanced for why people might want to drink. Uh, the main reason, uh, and the one that satisfies me the best, is that uh, uh, whatever you want to call it scientifically, however you want to define this thing, when I take a drink, it does something for me. I like it. I like the way it feels. I get something out of it. Uh, and I'll pursue that good feeling. I'll pursue uh, that um, uh, relaxation, uh, intoxication, or whatever it is that, uh, uh, that, I, that I get out of it. And that may be an individual choice, but... Uh, uh, that's why I come back. That's why I do it again. That's why I put up with the hangovers, all that kind of good stuff. So the theories behind this, one is self-medication. If you ask people, you know, you know, how do you relax? Well, I, you know, I go home and have a couple of drinks, you know, kick back, have a couple of drinks, have dinner, and then have an after-dinner drink or two, watch television, and go to bed. That's how I, that's how I chill out, calm down, relax. Uh, I get nervous, I'm cranky, you know, I have a couple of drinks and that chills me out. I'm worried about stuff. I've got a lot of stress in my life. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 John Prine uh, died uh, in the early days of the COVID-19 virus. He died of COVID-19. And he was one of my favorite singers. I really love John Prine. Uh, but he had uh, a song called Dear Abby, uh, the advice columnist lady. Uh, and every time I get to this stage in, uh, of the lecture, I think of the lines, Dear Abby, Dear Abby, my fountain pen leaks. My wife hollers at me and my kids are all freaks. Every time I get up, 
ever side I get up on is the wrong side of bed, and if it weren't so expensive, I'd wish I were dead. Uh, that kind of stress relief, the day-to-day uh, brutality of our mundane lives. Uh, if I'm drinking for those reasons, if I'm imbibing, I'm not doing convivial drinking, nor am I doing ritual drinking. I'm doing utilitarian drinking, and utilitarian drinking is self-medication. I promise you, as you pursue this career, you're going to have someone who tells you, well, don't make such a damn big deal out of it. I can drive better drinking uh, than most people can sober, uh, to which I can only respond, get to a doctor, man. If you drive better drinking, better than most people do sober, there's something wrong with you, and you probably should be on some kind of medication, and it shouldn't be alcohol. Anyway, uh, so that's one reason. Uh, th- and there are all kinds of reasons that people will advance, curiosity, peer pressure, etc., and so forth, but that's not the, why they continue. Uh, power theory, personal sexual creativity, etc., that type of power, I think it enhances me some way or another. Uh, I mean, you know, there are all kinds of examples of brilliant, wonderful, creative people out there who are terrifically successful, even though they're uh, even though they're drinkers, right? Uh, and uh, Upton Sinclair, the same guy that wrote *The Jungle*, that powered the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, uh, wrote a book about some of his contemporaries and people that. Uh, uh, were uh, successful artists and things in his day and age. Uh, people like uh, uh, Jack, uh, like uh, Jack London, who wrote, uh, uh, you know, uh, Call of the Wild, and Isadora Duncan, the, uh, the the dancer, and Dorothy Parker, the poet, and uh, all of these. Well, H. L. Mencken, the writer, all of these wonderful creative people. And um, uh, Sinclair said in his uh, book, The Cup of Fury, uh, that all of these people are creative, wonderful, spectacular geniuses in spite of their addictions and not because of it. And there's tremendous truth in that. So the power theories always let you down. Mind expansion, spirituality, human beings have always used drugs in order to connect uh, to the world of the spiritual, to try to bridge the gap between tangible right now, here here and now reality, and something bigger than we are. Uh, and uh, peyoteros of the Native American church who uh, who take peyote at the end of an elaborate ritual in order to enter the world of the uh, of the spiritual, or Catholics who uh, eat the flesh of Christ and drink his blood every time that they take Holy Communion through the ritual of substantiation. Uh, uh, you know, all of this is a way to connect. Uh, and people use drugs. Nah, alcohol's kind of a weak one for this, but there are other drugs that they use as well to open themselves up to other world experiences, to cosmic truths, whatever. Uh, and then, in the case of males, repressed homosexuality. Thank you very much, Dr. Freud. Uh, they were sucking on a bottle because, well, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so, and sometimes, as Dr. Freud said, a cigar really is just a cigar. But um, anyway, uh, so there are a lot of theories to explain why people might want to drink, and we're going to look at some of them as we go further along in this and, and in some other classes. Here's what doesn't happen. Alcohol does not make you prettier, wittier, tittier, smarter, a better dancer, taller, more interesting, sexier, or more popular. It doesn't do all of those things, although people believe it does. They do believe it does. Uh, All my life, coming from a kind of dysfunctional southern family, 
Uh, I've always, you know, the girls always look prettier at closing time. Well, they always are prettier, wittier, and tittier after about five or six drinks, right? Uh, uh, yeah, sexist, I know, but still, that's part of the culture. Alcohol doesn't make you any of those things. Alcohol makes you drunk. That's what alcohol makes you. And when you're drunk, you're not in your right mind, ladies and gentlemen. When you're drunk, you're insane. And I mean that literally. You are unable to tell right from wrong. You're unable to assess your situations for safety and danger. You're unable to determine to make a difference between who's pretty and who's not. Uh, you make all kinds of bad decisions when you're drinking. And sometimes those bad decisions get you in trouble. Uh, this is the stocks. Uh, people in the old days, uh, in their uh, attempts to try to regulate people's drinking and other types of sinful behavior, uh, uh, have um, taken some rather outrageous steps to uh, to make people, you know, do right. If you believe that uh, alcohol is a sin or a moral failing, then uh, you're probably preaching atonement at people. You know, uh, stop that. That's a sin. That's evil. Uh, you're a sinner. That's bad. You're going to hell. Hit your knees. Suck it up. Get right with God. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. And those approaches have worked from time to time with some people. They don't work well. They don't work universally. And... Uh, I have met some people who very sincerely believed, we were sincere believers who've worn out a couple of sets of kneecaps trying to uh, get right with God, but they still have a drinking problem until they do something about it. Uh, we in this country, uh, and we come from a long line of people back in Europe, uh, if, you, if your ancestors are from Europe, who believe that uh, passing laws and punishing people are the way to do it. Now, there are other cultures that uh, didn't, didn't have, that, uh, uh, have that issue, nor did they have that kind of response. It was like, uh, yeah, if you're different, well, that's the way God made you, I guess. I'll just put up with it, you know, and, uh, and are pretty tolerant about folks who are deviant from what the rest do. Uh, Western European people are not like that. Uh, so we see it as a legal issue. And one of the things that uh, is something that can be solved legally, and one of the things that if you believe uh, uh, deviant behavior or behavior that's you know, outside the norm or what's acceptable for the rest of us uh, can be corrected by punishment, then you're not usually hesitant to uh, use it. So imagine back in uh, uh, the early colonial days in the United States, say I'm in Salem, uh, and I get really liquored up one night down at the public house, and as I'm out and on my way home, I encounter good wife Brown, and she just looks like she's the a hottest thing that a pilgrim could ever encounter on the street, and I pinch her on the backside and scandalize the whole community. Uh, they're liable to put me in that stock uh, right there. Uh, and I will be held up for ridicule and for humiliation uh, by everyone in the community and um, for uh, the heinous crime of pinching good wife Brown. And uh, the idea behind that is no one wants to be uh, ridiculed. No one wants to be shamed. No one wants to be punished publicly like this in front of everyone. And they throw you gar throw garbage at you and call you names and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, and so when you're uh, subjected to that, what you really should be doing is saying, I, I don't want this to happen to me, so I'm going to correct my behavior so that this doesn't happen anymore. That's the way you think too, right? Yeah, I thought so. Uh, so actually what I'm thinking while I'm up there hanging in that stock and pillory, and I'm the guy over here on the right, this guy's being mean to him, he's doing something to his ear, uh, and I'm that guy, 
And uh, I'm thinking while I'm up there, you think that was drunk? Wait till you open this thing up. I'll show you drunk. You ain't seen nothing yet. And where does good wife Brown live again? <laughs> you know, because I am not about to correct my behavior just because you're doing this to me. Uh, so there's a false premise there. If I'm an alcoholic, there's another thing going on here. You're thinking that because uh, you, you're doing this to me that somehow or another I can control my drinking, and I can't. Uh, so I'm going to go right back to doing what I did before when you let me out. The guy on this side is doing something to his ear. This is a little line yap that... Uh, 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 they gave to repeat offenders and stuff like that. If you do this a lot uh, and putting you in the stocks isn't doing much, it's not changing your behavior or anything like that, uh, we'll nail your ear to the wood before we let you go. Um, you don't have a screwdriver. You don't have <laughs> a claw hammer. You don't have any tools to remove the nail, but you can go home anytime you want to. I imagine my ancestors must have been walking down the street with their ears looking like those streamers that you used to put on the handles of your bicycle, you know, <laughs> flapping in the wind. But anyway, a little brutal. Uh, it didn't change behavior. It didn't work. Anti-alcohol activism swept our land in the 19th century. Uh, and for good reason, too. And you, you've been assigned to, to watch uh, a film, and the film is uh, posted in your blackboard. It's actually three films. It's a three-part series called Prohibition uh, that talks about how this movement emerged. Uh, and anti-alcohol activism uh, began in the 19th century for good reason. And, uh, you know, there were people who... Uh, our ancestors on this country drank like fishes. John Adams, second president of the United States, had his first mug of rum with breakfast. Uh, they rolled out of bed drinking, they rolled into bed drinking, and all in between they drank. Uh, so there's lots of drinking going on. Uh, alcoholism uh, dipsomania was a great big problem in this country. Dr. Benjamin Rush, who uh, uh, signed the Declaration of Independence, uh, wrote uh, about dipsomania, the, the, uh, the alcohol inebriate, and how they were sick. It was not a question of, uh, uh, you know, morality or right or wrong or anything like that. It was a question of illness. If alcohol's the problem, what might be the solution? It's logical, it's reasonable. If the problem is that you're drinking alcohol and that's what's causing your life to go to hell, let's get rid of alcohol. Uh, yeah, that was a good idea, except it didn't work. And all kinds of, uh, of uh, exertion was employed to try to get people to not drink. I like the sexual blackmail up here on the left. Lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. So if you're going to drink, dude, you, you're cut off, and there's no more of that resource for you. So, you know, choose, buddy. <laughs> you know? Uh, and uh, this uh, woman over here, one Miss Carrie Nation, she's one of the most fascinating women in American history to me. Uh, she was a truly messed up woman, and I don't mean that it, and, uh, as an insult. I mean that in terms of trying to understand of who, who she was and what she did. And if you understand the life of Carrie Nation, she was an abused little girl. She had an alcoholic father. Her first husband was a doctor. He was an alcoholic. He abused her, too. Uh, she hated alcohol and anyone who used it. She made no distinction between the sin and the sinner. <laughs> uh, she uh, probably was at least bipolar uh, with psychotic features because God talked to her and he told her where to go and what to do. Uh, and she went there with that hatchet in her right hand and that Bible in her left. And she led these Victorian women with 
bustles and long skirts and button-up boots and big wide hats with parrots and whatnot on them into saloons and kicked the hell out of everybody in there, chopped up the beer kegs, tore up the bar, broke all the mirrors, shattered the uh, whiskey, uh, and got arrested like umpteen times. She spent a lot of time getting arrested, and so did the ladies who followed her. Uh, she was famous for conducting hatchetations all over the new state of Kansas uh, and um, uh, was relentless in that regard. Uh, there were other uh, uh, people who uh, grew up uh, or who came into prominence around this time. And I'll... I'll uh, uh, I, yeah, I might as well talk about that now. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Francis Willard, who was president of the Women's Christian uh, Temperance Union, for instance. And there's a big difference between temperance and, uh, uh, and prohibition. Temperance people preach moderate, reasonable, and rational use of beverage alcohol, whereas prohibition is banning alcohol and the use of alcohol and the sale of alcohol and everything by law, right? Uh, so uh, the, the temperance movement was quickly replaced moving into the 20th century uh, by the prohibition movement and the prohibition movement actually spun off a prohibition party there were people there were you could be a republican a democrat a prohibitionist uh, and the prohibitionists uh, um, uh, really moved to ban alcohol everywhere. And there are uh, were some states that went dry, counties within states that went dry, and eventually in 1919 they passed the 18th Amendment. It was adopted, and in 1920 the whole country went dry. You couldn't buy alcohol anywhere in the United States legally except through government license legally liquor stores, and you had to have special dispensation uh, to do that. Um, alcohol was getting a very, very bad rap from everyone. Over here uh, is a, 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 a painting, I think it was in the 17th or 18th century, uh, and uh, this is uh, Beer Street, and over here is Gin Alley. Uh, and you can see that over here with uh, the, the soft liquor, the beer, that people were drinking and they were productive and healthy and all of that good stuff. But over here, uh, sexual uh, uh, excesses, uh, illness, people are sick, they're lazy, they're not working. Here's a drunk woman dropping her infant over the side of the stairs, all kinds of horrible things. And this is where we got the notion of demon rum. Well, demon rum and very militant uh, uh, approaches to controlling other people's behavior, such as prohibition, soon overtook the temperance movement. And temperance was no longer uh, a, a, the focus of a lot of organizations, including Francis Willard's. Now, something else was going on here, too, at the time, and that was the women's suffrage movement. You had people like Alice, uh, 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 by my goodness, I lost her, I mean, Susan B. Anthony. I was trying to say Alice Toklas, but uh, yeah, she was involved in that, too. Uh, but uh, uh, all of these um, uh, people had uh, other issues that were tied up. Uh, in, in this, the anti-war movement around World War I, uh, the mothers against the war, I didn't raise my son to be a soldier uh, kind of thing. And uh, that was tied in to the prohibition movement. And the women's right to vote was tied in to the prohibition movement. And ladies, this is an election year. And I uh, not to shame you or to put you down or to put any pressure on you or anything like that, but women have only had the right to vote in this country for about a hundred years now. Uh, uh, that's not long. And no one gave your great granny the right to vote. She fought for it and she fought hard 
and she was beaten, and she was jailed, and she was abused in any number of ways to get that right to vote. And if I were a woman, no kidding, uh, this election year, I would crawl over broken glass to get to the polls because it's that important. Anyway, off my soapbox again. Frances Willard, uh, one of her issues was not just the right to vote and, and uh, uh, to protect families by banning alcohol in the United States, and that was her goal. But another thing that was a big deal for her was women's rights, and especially the, uh, and I, I, I use women, I put air quotes around that. You can't see me doing it, but I'm doing it. Uh, uh, put the air quotes around it. One of her big accomplishments as president of uh, the Women's Temperance Union was to agitate for and finally attain legislation that raised the age of consent for women, air quotes again, in the United States of America to raise the age up to age 16 because almost universally throughout the United States at that time, this is just before prohibition, um, a woman could content, uh, consent to sexual behavior with a man generally between the ages of 10 and 12 years old. That's throughout the nation. Delaware was an exception to that. The age of consent was seven. Seven. That's about the time you're in the second grade, just in case you're wondering. Anyway, so a bunch of things were tied up into this, and the empowerment of women was a big deal. Women really pushed uh, the prohibition movement in this country. The 18th Amendment passed in 1919. It became effective in 1920. Uh, the Noble Experiment of Prohibition lasted from 1920 until 1933. And like a lot of things that happen uh, when you pass laws, which are reactive, and we've talked about that in the 1304 class, uh, even though it was adopted with the best of intentions, prohibition had a lot of unintended and unhealthy consequences uh, attached to it. This is uh, the series, uh, Prohibition, uh, from Ken uh, Burns. And Ken Burns is brilliant. Uh, he is a, a, a fantastic documentarian. He's never produced anything that I didn't think was spectacular. And uh, he's got the three-part series of Prohibition, A Nation of Drunkards, uh, A Nation of Scofflaws, and a nation of hypocrites, and they're all just a tad under two hours each, so, you know, don't put them off to the last minute. And, and uh, I hesitate to say, uh, I, I, I ha I'm not hesitant to say that if, you, if you're taking this class because this kind of thing interests you and this is something of interest to you, you're not going to have any problem watching this thing, you, you know. I've had people watch all three of them back to back to back. You know, but it's fascinating. Uh, prohibition did not rid the world of alcoholism, and it couldn't. You can't legislate away an illness, and alcohol dependency is an illness. It has to be treated as an illness. Uh, there were early treatment efforts that, uh, uh, you know, that were somewhat effective, and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, in uh, the um, discussion of uh, the big book, also in this uh, module. Dr. Benjamin Rush uh, was uh, a big proponent, the earliest pusher of uh, uh, the disease concept of alcoholism in this country. Uh, the Washingtonians was, were a religious group, was a religious group that uh, pushed sobriety uh, in this country. The emergence of Alcoholics Anonymous came out of the Washingtonians and the Oxford groups and the Emmanuel groups and a whole bunch of other groups uh, that uh, were uh, early efforts to create uh, alternatives for people who were, were sick and wanted to get well. Modern treatment emerged from all that. 
uh, and modern treatment and treatment today. And today, uh, guys, I still know people out there who will say, yes, it's an illness, but they'll treat it like it was a moral puddle. My, uh, problem and say yes these people are sick and then treat them like they're just bad people doing bad things uh, and th there is a disconnect from what they say and what they do and what I'm hoping that we can come to some kind of agreement on as we move forward here is where there's a reconnect of uh, both uh, the way we behave in providing treatment to people and how we think about the people we're treating and what we say our uh, philosophical underpinning is. The moral model holds, you knew that uh, cocaine was addicted. You knew that alcohol would get you in trouble. Your mother taught you that this stuff was a sin, and you did it anyway. Therefore, you uh, not only are responsible for the problem, you're also responsible for the solution. And the moral model will also tell you you know, that you're less than, you're a sinner because of this, you're a weakling because of this, you know. I can't help but think about what's going on in our country now, and mask. If you wear a mask, you know, you're not showing proper faith. Uh, you know, real men don't wear masks, uh, that kind of deal. Medical model uh, comes along, and Dr. Uh, William Silkworth, who uh, we'll be discussing in this uh, class, too, uh, wrote The Doctor's Opinion in Alcoholics Anonymous, and he was uh, uh, very uh, uh, instrumental in promoting the idea that uh, uh, people who become alcoholics aren't bad people. They're not responsible for uh, how their body reacts to alcohol. Uh, they... They have some moral issues, they certainly do, and he didn't deny that, but uh, an alcoholic is a person who is basically allergic to alcohol. They drink alcohol and it produces uh, responses in them that it doesn't uh, produce in other people, and that's true. We'll talk about that later on, too. Uh, but because you ha this is a medical issue and because it's a physiological problem that you can't control, you're not responsible for the solution to it either. The Enlightenment model says that, yes, you're responsible for the problem. No one sat on your chest and made you drink, did they? Uh, but you're not responsible for the way your body reacted to it, so you're not responsible for the solution, we, we, and we'll help you out with that. The compensatory problem says that you're not responsible for the problem. You didn't know what was going to happen until you tried it. You know, you saw other people getting away with it and everything was cool, but not you. Uh, so it's not your fault that you got into this. But now that you're aware that you are into it, it is your problem getting yourself out. Do something about it, right? Now we've got choice models that are governed by principles of choice and motivation, and that at a subliminal level sometimes we make choices uh, because we're motivated to do one thing or another. And that motivation may be to avoid consequences, but generally that motivation is to do something else. Public health model. This is an illness. It demands thoughtful, evidence-based treatment and prevention efforts. It demands understanding and scientific, evidence-based uh, conclusions about what it is that we're dealing with, etc. <coughs> and this is just uh, this is not a comprehensive list of the many, many different ways to consider a a addictions. There are you know, subdivisions of all of these uh, belief systems and yet others that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, but the way we think about the addiction, uh, or, or the way we think about addiction, and uh, or just simple drug use apart from addiction is going to dr drive uh, our behavior. Our beliefs about that will drive our behavior. Anyway, uh, in Texas, once upon a time, the primary consideration of an effective counselor is that they were addicts in long-term recovery. Uh, in the big book of alcoholic economics, uh, uh, it said uh, 
uh, Alcoholics Anonymous has said something along the lines of the therapeutic value of one addict helping another is, uh, you know, is beyond uh, evaluation or something to that effect. Is beyond measure. Uh, the um, and that and that is true in that uh, in the in the AA movement, uh, but. Sometimes just having an experience in recovery uh, limits me in the things that I can do with other people. When I try to make my recovery experience your recovery experience, then we're nothing alike. Uh, so uh, it, it can be a good thing. You can get an ex you have an experiential novel, uh, uh, experiential level of knowledge that uh, people who aren't in recovery don't have. Uh, but um, that doesn't mean that you're a better counselor than people who are not in recovery just because you've had that experience. In Texas, once upon a time, you didn't need a license either or a certification of any kind. You just made yourself a sign and said, drug counselor, hang it on your door and away you go. Uh, those days are gone. In the 70s, uh, 60s and 70s, it was... Uh, decided uh, by people in the state and written into the codes of the state that we would certify counselors here and they had something that was called a CADAC, C-A-D-A-C, -A -A Certified Alcoholism and Drug Abuse Counselor. Uh, and in 1992, the LCDC, Licensed Chemical Dependency Counselor, replaced that certification with a license. And uh, to get uh, to obtain this license, you, and it's a minimum entry level license. Uh, you have to uh, uh, have at least a two year degree, an applied science degree. At the, at the, that's a, at a minimum. Uh, it's kind of an intriguing field, though. This is uh, uh, probably the earliest that you can enter into something like this. Uh, the demands of the field uh, created. Uh, uh, a competency-based procedure. That means that whenever you're through with your training, you still have to go through a testing procedure in order to be able uh, to practice, to get a license and to, and to work in the state. Uh, loosening the grip uh, talks about some general concepts, uh, but they Primarily, the focus is on alcohol, but regulation focuses on all kinds of things. And regulation is kind of prohibition plus today in the United States because there are a lot of substances used in the U.S. that are still prohibited, and uh, we're we're not uh, you know not allowed to use them under any circumstances. Uh, we argue that this has to be this way for health reasons for protection of people from product liabilities and things like that. Uh, I personally don't believe that. Uh, drug overdose deaths in the U.S. rose 4.6% in 2019, last year, uh, to 70,980 uh, deaths. Uh, and that included uh, 50,042 uh, uh uh, involving opioids, and you hear a lot about the opioid epidemic, uh, right? Meanwhile, back at the ranch, while that's going on, cigarette smoking during the same period of time is responsible for more than 480,000 deaths per year in the United States. That's almost half a million. Uh, that's more than twice what we see with COVID uh, this year so far. This includes more than 41,000 deaths resulting from secondhand smoke exposure. Do you hear anyone hollering for banning cigarettes, for banning vaping, for ban banning the use of other tobacco products, which are also uh, uh, detrimental to people? Huh, wonder why. Might it have something to do with lobbyists and uh, what money will buy you and protections and uh, patent political pockets and things like that? Boy, that was really alliterative. Padding political pockets. Eh. Anyway, 
same with alcohol, and alcohol's a business. Uh, a couple of years ago, a few years back, may have been more than a couple, you, you may have remembered, uh, I think it was Bush, Anheuser Bush, that, uh, uh, and Budweiser, they, uh, they did some really cool things, like, uh, uh, they, there was they canned water after Hurricane Ike, so you could get a six pack of water, and they distributed it to people, just you know, like uh, uh, you would, um, you know, bottled water, except it was in a can, and they, they sent it all over the place, uh, you know, uh, gratis. You didn't have to buy it; it was a relief effort, uh, and it cost them a lot of money to do that. Uh, and then they spent a whole lot of other money uh, boasting about having done it so that you will buy their beer. Uh, they uh, donated uh, a portion of every beer that you bought uh, so that you would get, you could, uh, if you bought a beer uh, for whatever a beer costs, I don't even remember. I don't even know. <laughs> uh, the uh, It didn't cost that much when I stopped. But anyway, you... Uh, a portion, a nickel, out of your dollar goes to the uh, 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 to building a uh, homes for veterans, uh, people who are coming back from you know Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and what have you, uh, and up to a million dollars. They spent a million dollars on homes and whatnot or whatever it was, and then they spent fifteen million advertising it, bragging about it. And this is how you do business. Uh, they have lobbyists too, uh, and sometimes these lobbyists and people ha do do weird stuff. In Texas, we had uh, for a long time you could not get mixed drinks in Texas. When I was a kid, you couldn't buy liquor by the drink, uh, and it didn't come around until I was a grown up. And there were two entities. They say that politics makes strange bedfellows, and I guess it does that kept uh, liquor by the drink out of the state of Texas. And that was the Southern Baptist Association, which didn't want you to drink, period, because eh, they're Baptists. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the beer industry, Anheuser-Busch, Bush Bavarian, Budweiser, did not want liquor by the drink, because if you're getting liquor by the drink, you're not buying Budweiser, are you? This was before they figured out they could sell liquor by the drinks in a can and uh, make a lot of money, and then they supported it. But these two entities uh, fought very hard to keep liquor by the drink out of Texas. You could go to bars and get setups. Uh, what that means is uh, if I go to the Little Spot or the Hideaway or the Refuge or the We Hotel or whatever, uh, you know, uh, the Cheyenne Social Club, uh, I could go in and order a setup. And what a setup is, is everything I need to make a screwdriver except for the vodka. Everything that I need to make a salty dog except for the gin. Everything that I need to make a Bloody Mary except for the alcohol. Uh, I had to bring BYOB, bring your own booze, had bring, bring your own bottle, had to take it in there. They'd supply me everything else. Then they decided that you could have drinks if you were in a private club. So the bars would sell you for 50 cents a membership in the club. <laughs> you know, you had the card, they signed it, you'd go in there and drink mixed drinks. But we finally got uh, uh, liquor by the drink. These are the same people who had blue laws in the state of Texas, where because uh, the Sabbath was God's day and you weren't supposed to work on it, you couldn't buy clothes on Sunday. You couldn't buy clothing. You couldn't buy hardware. You you know you couldn't buy stuff that was non-essential because you were supposed to be in church and relaxing, right? Texas was a weird place in the early '60s, but we got you know we got we got beyond that. We had dry counties all over Texas and uh, you know you uh, and and damp ones uh, a damp county is where you can't buy hard liquor but you can buy beer right you can go to to beer street but we don't have a gin alley over here 
um, and uh, uh, and then counties where you couldn't buy anything. And then people lived in those counties and would bring alcohol in. And you could, you know, if you got stopped in there bringing alcohol into the county, if you were old enough to have it and it was for your own use, it was pretty okay, but you couldn't buy your own. Lufkin County and, uh, I mean, Lufkin up in Angelina County, uh, they were a little bit weird. Uh, and I think it was Angelina County, if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure it was, uh, where there... A uh, uh, county government got together and decided that Angelina County, uh, you know, went all the way uh, up to heaven, and uh, that um, all the way up to heaven uh, was uh, Angelina County, and uh, that it was um, dimensional in ways that we don't usually consider counties to be dimensional. Consequently, they wanted to pass laws so that you couldn't have a drink in an airplane if you were flying through Angelina County space. And I think that's just, um, you know, maybe they got too much time on their hands or something, you know. Uh, so, but that was what they wanted to do. It didn't pass, thank goodness. Uh, and uh, there were places, uh, Deer Park, uh, was kind of weird in the areas around Deer Park and Pasadena. You could go from wet to dry to damp. Uh, you know, it was just, uh, it was confusing. It's what it was. Uh, and um, that's, um, you know, the way people tried to regulate uh, uh, liquor uh, legally. The, um, We had some agitation groups. They're still out there. Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, uh, Students Against uh, against Drunk Driving. Used to be drunk drivers, but we don't want to hurt any <laughs> drunk drivers' feelings. So nowadays it's Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Uh, and uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, Fathers Against Drunk Driving, Students Against Drunk Driving. And then there's Damn, Drunks Against Mad Mothers. That's a natural organization, by the way. Uh, the... Uh, uh, and and uh, they agitated to get the laws changed. In Texas, used to have a 0 0.10 was a, a, a legal intoxication level in Texas. Now it's 0 0.08. That was uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Uh, and so we still have those agitation groups that uh, are, are out there. But for the most part, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the laws reflect... The norms, the desires, the you know, uh, uh, the reality of the people living in the regions, and we try to you know pass laws that will. And some of the laws don't make sense, and we'll talk about that in another class. But uh, uh, alcohol's a business, and uh, we have lobbyists who you know uh, are in the halls of every government. They're everywhere. One of the things that you'll discover as you're taking your prevention classes and things like that is uh, if you are um, putting on a presentation about how to curtail, say, for instance, the Alka Pops that were popular a few years back, uh, my uh, colleagues in the uh, prevention field would have a, um, a conference or they'd have, you know, something like that and look around and there would be representatives from the alcohol industry there giving out buttons, uh, supporting Budweiser and the right for adults to make their own choices, et cetera, and so forth, uh, who had infiltrated uh, even the organizations that were there to curtail their activities, you know. It's kind of like uh, uh, wearing a white hood to an NAACP meeting <laughs> you, you stick out a little bit and it uh, you, you know and you don't get your point across the uh, uh, so it's a it's, it's an ongoing uh, battle in that regard with uh, with people uh, alcohol lobbyists are very successful however uh, in uh, government at talking to people who are at, the, at the city county state in federal levels, and they spend a lot of money uh, making sure their interests are represented in Washington, D.C. Consequently, you know, taxes have gone up on everything. 
cigarettes uh, are outrageous. I quit smoking when uh, cigarettes hit three dollars a pack. I mean, you know, they, they, uh, you know, God and Jesus can't make a cigarette that I'll pay, you know, pack of cigarettes I'll pay more for three dollars for. But uh, uh, you know, and most of the money on the uh, on that you spend on the cigarettes are um, uh, sin tax. Uh, basically, uh, you're paying. Uh, uh, money uh, that uh, is increasingly going higher and higher, uh, and it's tax money, and it goes to the government. It goes into uh, paying for, you know, treatment for people who have lung cancer and emphysema and that kind of thing, and uh, for uh, for people to raise your taxes some more and to do information campaigns uh, such as Truth Initiative uh, that. Uh, uh, is always taking on the tobacco industry. In any case, uh, you don't see that with alcohol, and that's because the last time there was uh, an increase on the companies that produce alcohol in the United States of America, Ronald Reagan was president. You do the math. <laughs> you know, it's just uh, they're very successful in looking out uh, for their own industry. If we were to uh, raise taxes, for instance, on drinks, 10 cents, 10 cents on every beer sold, on every drink consumed uh, at, uh, at uh, Baby O's, you know, uh, any of those places, then we would have enough money to find um, uh, many uh, efforts to undo the uh, bad things that happen because of people drinking in this country, and bad things do happen because of people uh, drinking in this country. If you live in Harris County, Texas, uh, or if you drive in Harris County, Texas, you are moving through the most dangerous place in North America to drive. <laughs> uh, certainly the most dangerous place in the United States of America. You are more likely to be in an accident in Harris County, Texas involving alcohol than anywhere else in the United States. You are more likely to be injured by someone who's under the influence of alcohol in Harris County, Texas, than you are anywhere else in the United States. And you're more likely to die in an alcohol-related car crash in Harris County, Texas, than you are in anywhere else in the United States. Kind of makes you proud, huh? We're number one. Anyway, alcohol uh, is an industry and uh, beca uh, it's a business, and they spend a lot of money to make a lot of money, and uh, uh, they advertise their products, and, uh, you know, that's okay, I guess. It's all right. We don't let cigarette companies do it anymore. No more dancing Doral packs. No more uh, people with black eyes selling Terryton, saying, I'd rather fight than switch. Uh, no more... Uh, Marlboro man riding the high country and being all macho and everything. You know, we don't have that. Uh, uh, we still have mail advertisements, uh, and I get some of them sometimes from Marlboro and other places, you know, still trying to convince me to use their products. Uh, once upon a time, I'd have probably been tempted. But, um, and, and uh, the commercials, the commercials can be, by the way, uh, you know, uh, awfully, <laughs> awfully entertaining, uh, and I always got a kick out of, I, I still get a kick out of watching, uh, you know, commercials on TV and some of the things that they're trying to sell in the, in the clever ways uh, that they go about selling it. But uh, cigarette advertisers can no longer sponsor sporting events. Uh, there, there were times you you could take your kid to the Little League ballpark and there's, you know, Marlboro cigarette sign out there on the, uh, on, on the fence. And, uh, uh, you know, and we would go to the Sue's Grocery when I was a kid, a little mom-and-pop neighborhood grocery, and I could buy uh, bubblegum cigars and candy cigarettes and things like that so I could practice smoking when I became of age, which for me was 12, by the way. Uh, so those things are, are part and parcel of it. Uh, there are regulations on alcohol advertising, and one of the regulations on alcohol advertising is something that you never see. 
is someone taking a drink of their alcohol because it's against the law to put that in a commercial. But they can pick it up, smile at it, set it down, and you can see the the condensate dribbling down the half-empty or the totally empty glass, but you don't see the actor or actress take a drink. They also don't show you uh, people staggering, stumbling, vomiting, fighting, groping, or any of the other filthy, nasty stuff that you see people who are intoxicated uh, doing. And they generally show you uh, buff, healthy, uh, sexy, young people having a swell time, you know, uh, cute horses uh, and, and spotted dogs and, you know, all this wonderful uh, stuff. But, um, you know, not, not consequential stuff. And why would they, you know? Uh, uh, you know, lying in a hospital bed with a cirrhotic liver. Here's to you, brother. You, so uh, you get a you get a very skewed uh, picture of this. Uh, uh, which one is it now? Is it Dos Equis? I think it may be Dos Equis or Corona. Find your beach. You know that's a that's a cool one. I like that commercial. I love red striped beer commercials. They're for Bahamian beer, uh, and they have this black guy in a in a in a very uh, uh, you know, formal tuxedo with a red stripe across the front of the tuxedo that, you know, signifies his office ambassadorship or whatever. Uh, but they're hilarious. They're not politically correct. He will say something along the lines of red stripe beer helping our white friends dance for 30 years. Hooray beer. <laughs> Uh, crack me up. Look them up on the internet. Uh, red Stripe Beer. Been making ugly people beautiful for 30 years. Hooray beer. Anyway. Uh, so it's... Uh, but, uh, even though I like the commercials, I'm not likely to be swayed by them. I'm not going to go out and buy some Red Stripe because the guy entertained me on television. Uh, most uh, beer ads are... Uh, geared toward a younger population between for people between the ages of 1835 single men is uh, where where the real big target audience is uh, there are some targets to uh, there are specific products that target ethnicities like Colt 45 malt liquor King Cobra malt liquor slits malt liquor they're targeting young African American men single men that's and promising you social acceptance, sexual uh, success, and all that good stuff with their advertisements. Uh, so, it, and and you'll see that if you drive through parts of town. You know, if you're in an ethnic part of town, there will be liquor signs that caters or that targets that particular ethnicity. Uh, in uh, uh, Hispanic neighborhoods, uh, Dos Equis, Tecate, uh, Cerveza Tecate, you know, Jose Cuervo. Uh, these kind of things. And if you get over into more affluent parts of town, you'll get Grey Goose, Stolichny, uh, Black Velvet, uh, that kind of stuff. So it depends on where you are. The, uh, uh, the advertisers uh, uh, are trying to hook you and, and sell you on things. Some of the more successful beer commercials over the years have been things like Miller Lite, Miller Lite is, uh, uh, came up with the test, Taste Great, Less Filling logo, and that came out in the 80s, man. And I mean, it's been rolling strong ever since. People uh, uh, know that uh, uh, automatically. And I'm going to show you a couple of uh, old uh, uh, Miller Lite commercials here in just a, uh, in just a minute. Uh, I'm also going to show you the Flintstone selling cigarettes. That's not... Uh, uh, something bogus off the internet. That's a real uh, advertisement. Uh, when the Flintstones came uh, on back in the early 60s, they were a prime time show. 
uh, they came on after, right after the evening news, if I remember correctly. I was, you know, like 11, 12, something like that, watching the Flintstones, and one of their sponsors were Winston Cigarettes. Uh, and if I'm on my deathbed and hear that jingle, I'll know it immediately because I've heard it a million times growing up. Winston tastes good like a <laughs> cigarette should. Uh, and, uh, you know, right there. <laughs> you know? So I'm a product of the advertising age. There are some of these things that just won't, uh, won't go away. Uh, but speaking of that, uh, let me take you to uh, uh, back to the uh, PowerPoint, and I'll show you a couple of commercials. I'm also going to show you an advertisement for Enzyte. Uh, several of those. Enzites are male enhancement products uh, and they are the Carter's little liver pills of television because at the time these products were coming out uh, they had a um, character, Smiling Bob, uh, who was a very, whose life had changed because he started using Enzite, which is a male enhancement. It hints that this makes you more virile or more impressive in terms of presentation, uh, but it never really tells you that it does anything for you. But I want you to watch how uh, uh, things are organized in these commercials uh, to attract people and what they're really selling, what they're really telling, uh, telling you. Uh, if you uh, uh, if you uh, watch commercials for what they're doing and how they're doing it, and they're doing it to you, by the way, uh, you're liable to swing back and forth between being amused uh, and and furious and wanting to you know uh, you know bite someone's head off because uh, the manipulation is there is obvious anyway. So I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint and show you a couple of um, things. The sound's a little weird on this. I don't know why. I, I pulled them off of YouTube, but they s still sound like I recorded it on my phone or something. I don't know. Uh, anyway, here we go. Uh, have to go back to Slideshow to make that live uh, from current slide. There we go. This, I think, is, uh, let me see, I'll know right quick. I think it's the, here's the football one. Yep. I love quarterbacks eating dirt. This one. I love playing too oh, I can't much. hear it. Eating way too much. Watching my team win with the twins. I know you didn't hear all that. Sorry. Uh, if you didn't hear all that, Coach Nickel, play off. It's. I'll play it again. Love playing two hand touch, eating way too much, watching my team win with the twins. Now that was better, right? With the with the sound on it. Uh, I love playing two hand touch. He's got a handful of blind chicks swinging her around, eating way too much, watching my team win with the twins, the Klamazuski twins, but also the twins he's referring to are holding their shirts up. Uh, when uh, I love quarterbacks eating dirt, pom-poms, and short skirts, uh, you're getting quick uh, images of women's body parts, which, um, again, is targeted towards uh, uh, um, males between the ages of 18 and 35. This is a, a, a commercial that 
appeals to young men. That's the only person they're trying, the only people they're trying to sell it to. It's not uh, to the to the young ladies in the crowd. So the uh, the 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 audience, the target audience, is very specific, and everything in that commercial is put together to uh, uh, sway a young fella. Uh, to buy and consume that kind of alcohol while at the same time promising promising social success, uh, social acceptance, sexual success. Uh, man, you get a lot out of that. This is a, a, an even more blatant uh, uh, one here, and this is a, a Miller-like commercial that doesn't have the Klamazuski twins in it, uh, but it does have uh, uh, K- Catherine Ballinger and her friend who are meeting for lunch uh, to, um, uh, you know, have, an, have a nice uh, uh, social get-together. And then something happens, it often happens when people get together and start drinking. So we'll just uh, show you that one. Miller Lite tastes great. Yeah, but I drink it because it's less filling. Great taste. Less filling. Great taste. Less filling. Great taste. Less filling. that right <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, as I said the Miller Lite commercials have uh, you know they've been doing the taste great less filling thing for a long time and uh, back in the uh, by around the mid 90s uh, Bubba Smith was uh, a former football player his biography was titled Kill Bubba Kill uh, he played the big uh, cop the, uh, who was a florist in the old police academy movies, right? So Bubba Smith wound up being um, uh, a parade marshal uh, for the uh, Orange Bowl. And I don't remember what year it was, but it was in the 90s. And he's going down the street, and he's doing his parade wave and all that good stuff. And uh, in the streets were these drunken kids, uh, college students and on one side of the street they started the chant tastes great and on the other side of the street they uh, started the chant less filling tastes great less filling tastes great less filling and uh, Mr. Smith said while he was sitting there doing his parade wave and going down the uh, street that it occurred to him that he was selling booze to children uh, and he said, I felt really ashamed of myself. So that when the parade ended, uh, he got out of the car and he never made another Miller Lite commercial. And uh, my respect for the man was, <laughs> you know, uh, through the roof uh, at that point. Now, we, uh, in addition to that, we have a bunch of uh, stuff that's advertised on television that's not worth much of anything. And we have things that uh, uh, are advertised on television that uh, once upon a time you never saw advertised. For instance, medication. There, uh, there's medication uh, that your doctor should discuss with you. 
Uh, and I've talked to a few physicians about this, and they're, they're not real happy about the, the situation. Big Pharma is coming straight to you and telling you, take this medication. And you know the t ones we're talking about. It's the, uh, the lady who, who's in a hole or has the cloud following her around, that kind of thing. You know, ask your doctor about new da 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 and then at the end, they tell you, don't take this because, you know, if you develop a rash or have a, a nosebleed or your head swells up and it's raining on a Thursday or you get explosive diarrhea, uh, you know, at the end. Uh, these are medicines that are basically prescription. Uh, and uh, 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 a physician uh, that uh, a friend of mine says that, you know, is, uh, people walk in and say, give me some of that stuff. <laughs> You know, because I, I saw it on TV, I like it. Uh, and um, that can be a problem, too, because medications often promise you things that they don't quite deliver. They're, you know, you probably have noticed that you can be ripped off by looking at products on TV. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of issues with that. Th then uh, there's the Enzyc commercials, and I'm going to show you those right quick, too. Uh, so that um, uh, there it is from current slide. Uh, first, I'm going to show you the Flintstones. Uh, this is an old commercial. This is the commercial I told you about from the 1960s. This isn't a joke. This is uh, what was uh, sponsoring really what was basically a child's television program. They sure work hard, don't they, Bonnie? Yeah? I hate to see them work so hard. Yeah, me too. Um, let's go around back where we can't see them. Gee, we ought to do something, Fred. Okay. How's about taking a nap? I got a better idea. Let's take a Winston break. That's it. Winston is the one filter cigarette that delivers flavor 20 times a pack. Winston got that filter blend. The year, friend. Filter blend makes the big taste difference, and only Winston has it up front where it counts. Here, the head of the pure white filter. Winston packs rich tobacco specially selected and specially processed for good flavor in filter smoking. Yeah, Barney, Winston tastes good like a... Uh... Cigarette Show. The Flintstone. Have been brought to you by Winston, America's best selling, best tasting filter I don't think anyone told Fred that smoking is what really made the dinosaurs go extinct. Uh, but anyway, other drugs. These are uh, Smiling Bob's Enzyme commercials. I think there are three of them. Uh, the most suggestive one, I believe, uh, they're all suggestive, but this is, uh, this is the one that uh, you don't have to be Sigmund Freud to figure out uh, the, the double entendres, the sexual uh, uh, innuendos and that kind of thing. And they, I said, you shouldn't have to be. I mean, it's selling male enhancement, whatever the hell that is. This is Bob. Seems to be a lot of rumors going around about this chubby Santa. That's because Bob made a call to Enzyme about natural male enhancement. And what did he get? Why, a sleigh full of confidence, a sack full of pride, and the one thing that every lady likes? The joy of a gift that keeps on giving. Call for your sample of Enzyme, or visit Enzyme.com to order online. Order today and get a free bottle of Erupt, the great tasting new energy shot from Enzyme. I don't even want to go there with that other product. The guy who um, 
uh, put this out, the, the, the Insight guy, the guy who was behind all this, uh, there he is right there. He, uh, the guy behind Smiling Bob uh, wound up going to prison for selling stuff on the mail, uh, and it, it didn't do anything. But it didn't claim to. Uh, you know, like I said, it's the Carter's little liver pills of, uh, of the modern era, and uh, uh, there was no medicine, no real value to any of it. This is Bob. Bob is doing well. Very well indeed. That's because not long ago, with just a quick phone call, Bob realized that he could have something better in his life. And what did he get? Why, a big boost of confidence, a little more self-esteem, and a very happy Mrs. at home. Call or go online now to get a sample pack. Hands like the Watch Daily Tablet for Natural Male Enhancements. One more. This is Bob. Bob is looking cool. And with a call to Enzyme about natural male enhancement, Bob is living large. In a few short weeks, Bob has a big new spring of confidence. A generous swelling of pride. And one thing every man deserves, a little well-earned respect from the neighborhood. Call or go online now to get a sample back at Enzyme. And And like I said, you don't have to be Sigmund Freud to figure, to, to figure this stuff out. That was uh, uh, pretty blatant. Uh, the language that was used, the, the inflections of the language, the imagery, the Santa Pole, the lost shorts, the swelling of pride, uh, uh, pretty blatant. And, uh, it, and it didn't deliver. I mean, they sold a bunch of this stuff, and guys were pretty disappointed. <laughs> but... Uh, there you go. Society is always in flux. Consequently, so is the public perspective on things like law and order, health and wellness, tolerance versus intolerance, particularly regarding certain substances and their use. Uh, those of us uh, of, of an age, I started smoking when I was 12 years old, and that was in the 60s. Uh, and I stopped when I was in my 40s. That was in the 90s. Uh, and uh, the, uh, 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 at the time that I stopped, uh, you know, it was weird because I started smoking cigarettes to be cool, to, to fit in with a certain group of people, to, uh, you know, uh, and over time, uh, my behavior didn't change, but the society changed around me uh, to the point that I, I that sometimes I'm shocked uh, when I see people smoking, particularly in certain circumstances. Um, but w once upon a time, I was the guy who was sitting there with a the lighter in one hand, cigarette in the other on an airplane, waiting for the no smoking sign to go off so I could spark up. We smoked in Kroger's while we're shopping, uh, going up and down the aisles shopping. We smoked at the doctor's office. We smoked at the dentist's office. We smoked in restaurants and bars and on public transportations and buses and taxis and all of that kind of good stuff. Uh, and nowadays, uh, you know, uh, even smokers go outside their house to smoke, <laughs> you know. So uh, society's changed in the way we, uh, we view things like smoking and drinking and, and doing other things. And uh, there's nothing uh, abnormal or weird or wrong about that. It's always been that way. I suspect it always will be. Uh, hope you got a lot out of this. Uh, but... Uh, this pretty much brings me to the uh, end of uh, you know what I have to say about chapter one, uh, and there'll be a, a quiz associated with it. You can watch this video, um, and the, it, and if you read the book, it's not a hard quiz. I mean, you know, it's not a hard quiz if you're a good guesser. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, if you have any questions, be sure to send them forward, uh, and um, I'll see you in the next uh, installment. Bye.